What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 19 of Into the Necrosphere. My name is Jackie Smith, and my guest on today's show is a man whose workload makes me feel like an absolute slacker by comparison. I am talking, of course, of the one and only Mike Hill. He is the presenter and co-presenter of a number of podcasts, including the excellent Everything Went Black, Metal Matters, and Necromaniacs. Um, He is also, perhaps most importantly, the founder, guitarist, and vocalist for Tombs. Uh, They have got a new EP coming out called Monarchy of Shadows. Uh, That'll be coming on the 28th of February through Season of Mist. Their last record uh, was uh, in 2017, The Grand Annihilation. I absolutely love it, and I've spoken about it many times on the show. So if you haven't heard it yet, uh, make sure that you do. Uh, I think there are two songs out now for the EP so far. Um, You're going to get to hear at least one of them in the next hour. Um, and uh, Mike and I hit on a whole bunch of topics, including what's been going on with Tombs for the last few years, metal in general, um, kind of the uh, the zeitgeist woke culture, um, and uh, a ton of MMA. So uh, stick around for that coming up in just a minute or two. Um, I am also going to be talking after the interview about a couple of new discoveries I've made, um, a band out of Glasgow called Luna Mantra, and then a band out of uh, Essen in Germany, called Frigoris or Frigoris. Um, This will probably be one of those names that uh, falls onto the pronunciation debate pile. But regardless, uh, you definitely are going to want to hear them. Uh, They are potentially the first two great releases of 2020, in my opinion. All I ask for in return, uh, of course, is that you like, share, subscribe, uh, leave us a five-star review if the spirit moves you to do so, uh, and comment on uh, the YouTube channel. Um, and also follow me on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Instagram is just into the necrosphere or at into the necrosphere, uh, and you can find us pretty easily on Facebook as well. So uh, thanks for uh, for checking us out. Um, I do hope you enjoy the conversation that I am about to have with Mike Hill. So please join me in welcoming him to the show. You, you just got back from the John uh, Wideron uh, book launch. Uh, yes, that was a few hours ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, John was um, actually John had interviewed me several times, and uh, he was on uh, the Metal Matters podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, to promote his forthcoming book, Raising Hell, which is now available for everyone to go out there and buy. And uh, he asked me at pretty short notice to come down to the strands which is you know kind of a legendary spot here in new york for literary types uh to read some passages from the book and you know do some uh impromptu interview questions like things like that it was a, a lot of fun also i got to do what alex skolnick the legendary alex skolnick, oh yeah yeah alex skolnick. no i i have i have a storied obsession with with testament and uh you know, I, I'm I'm not one to jump on a soapbox easily, but you know, as far as as bands that I think are criminally underrated, particularly you know, kind of given their, if you if you compare their latter day work to the the latter day work of the big four, I, you know, testament to me is, is you know, it, it, I, I fly their flag probably a little too aggressively sometimes. No, I agree. I mean, I think honestly, uh, testament in my my big four includes testament actually. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I like the early Anthrax stuff, but the 90s on sort of, uh, I think that band kind of fell a little flat for me over the years. I do have, I, I will say when it comes to 90s Anthrax though, I have a, I have a soft spot for The Sound of White Noise. And I think it, it might've been the time, I was 14 years old when that album came out. So, you know, when, when I got it, it was kind of sort of the height of, you know, discovering heavier stuff than, than the Black album. Um, so I, I love that album, but I, I agree with you. I, I can't see how you could compare. You know, if you if, if people are, are creating a true big four, I mean, you you can't have you can't have test, not not have testaments in there in favor of having Anthrax in there. But have you got uh, have you got work in the morning? I'm always working, bro. Always. <laughs> so, also, well, so so three podcasts, the band, and you have a day job now. Yeah, well, yeah, I had to pick up a day job because we were kind of um off the road. Uh, you know, we were between sort of record cycles and uh, I went back to like an old, um, you know, the old uh, reliable day job of uh, doing some engineering work. So, so yeah, I got to show up to work in a couple hours. 
Yeah. Well, dude, I, I again, I appreciate uh, I appreciate you you joining. I, I I'm working myself today, but that's one of the benefits of uh, the job I do. I I go to the office maybe once a month. Um, oh, nice, nice. Well, as I I manage people across uh, you know across Europe, so there's no real point in me being in the office because nobody that the the office closest to me, no one who works for me is actually there. So unless I have a meeting, there's no point in going. Um, which is good, but but how has it been for you, kind of joining or re- rejoining the daily grind? Uh, it's it's been okay. Um, it's just it's the people I've known for a really long time, and yeah, uh, you know it's it's uh, yeah, I got used to like not having to show up places and be certain places at certain times, and uh, having to do that again is is I guess in a way it's good for me, but also it's it's annoying, you know, um, certain things of have to be uh, more tightly coordinated i guess you know yeah yeah i mean do you think you you will kind of be able to continue doing everything that you do on on top of the job or is it just a case of sort of militant organ organization of your time well i i I always consider myself pretty organized but um i think that as soon as i don't have to do the job i'm probably not going to do it anymore yeah honestly you know yeah so uh, I, I want to talk about uh, about the new Tombs music, and uh, uh, you know, obviously, just the two songs that have come out so far, both of which I I, I love. I'm, you know, I'm be very upfront. I, I wouldn't really talk to anybody whose whose music I'm not a fan of anyway. I'm a huge fan of Tombs. I, I've said it on the show many times. This uh, this new stuff I, I really like. It's it sounds a lot more aggressive and a lot angrier uh, than anything on the Grand Annihilation. Um, is is that a kind of a byproduct of the new guys that you're playing with, um, or, or do you sort of take the Danzig approach, which is I I play the music and and everybody else is uh, is there as uh, as as accessories? I think uh, this time around with this this era of the band, this lineup is very hands on when it comes to writing music. Um, this is probably the first time in a while where I haven't written the entirety of the record myself. And um, I mean, you know, in the past, like I work with the drummer in the band and uh, come up with the 99% of the material. But uh, on the last EP, um, you know, it was a very uh, collaborative record. And, um, you know, I'll still the same sort of process for the majority of it, me and the drummer are working things out. But uh, but Justin it has, Justin Spath, our new drummer, has uh, contributed riffs actually guitar guitar parts you know and then and matt Maderos, our guitar player um has written a lot and you know and uh, it's been a very um refreshing kind of uh situation for me i say new but they don't feel new to me because we've been they've been in the band for like two years at this point but for anyone out there recording world it's been relatively new It'll be new for everyone else out there hearing the, the music, but yeah, yeah, it's um, it's it's still um, it's it's very very good because uh, I got kind of burned out, you know, a lot of pressure, and um, we have an entire new LP written too, by the way, which gonna be we're gonna be recording in in late May. So once again, I've written a lot of it, but there have been complete songs that have been brought to the table, and you know, we've worked together on arranging them. And, uh, you know, the lyrics, typically I write all the lyrics and that's not changed. So, uh, yeah, I think it's been good. We feel very, very um, ambitious. You know, that's a good word to use for that because I kind of feel like there's no limitations now and the, the bandwidth of ideas are, is wider now. So it's, mm. it's great. Well, I listened to your uh, Time the Avenger uh, episode on uh, on Everything Went Black, and I, I got the impression from some of the stuff that you were saying there that you kind of feel like this is a, a reboot for the band, or, or yeah, I, I, almost kind of a like a like a phase two or a phase three, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Uh, around the time of the Grand Annihilation, there was a lot of problems internally with the band, and um, you know, it was it actually the, the year following the release of that record is, was was rough because. Mm. Uh, it was very taxing. I, you know, it, there was a point where, I, in the middle of the record, actually recording "Grand Annihilation," uh, the band kind of disintegrated, really, and um, it was a very difficult uh, several months. You know, because we had tours booked, and um, I basically had no lineup. So hmm. the, the record was recorded. It was on Metal Blade, which is like a great opportunity for us, and um, I. 
I had to go out there and, and go on the road and support everything. And, and it was uh, an ordeal really, you know, but um, you know, I, I don't, to, to maybe to my detriment, I don't know how to quit or give up on things. So I just yeah. kept, kept moving forward and uh, you know, made it to the other side. Now I got a really great bunch of guys I'm playing music with and, you know, we all get along and everything's cool. What, what kind of kept things together? I, I, I guess during that, uh, grand annihilation recording period because i mean so so you i would i would have i was going to touch on this later but uh i know you did the uh you did an episode where, on, on one of your podcasts where you spoke about your your favorite albums of the decade the grand annihilation would would almost definitely be in my top 10 of uh really? of, okay. of the last 10 years without a doubt i mean you guys so in 2017 when it came out um it, it was only very narrowly pipped to the post uh, on my top 20 by um ruins of everest's uh exuvia and that's, I mean, that's, so that that is my favorite album of the decade. So it, that's it's a, a great album. <laughs> it's it's a record. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, it's a, it's a fucking phenomenal, phenomenal record, and it's one I I kind of keep going back to. You know, a, 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 in in the last four years, as much new music has come out, I probably listen to it, you know, two three times a month at least. But what 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 managed to kind of I, I guess hold things together during that time, and, and and equally, you know, how did you manage to sort of still create something so coherent and and that doesn't really sort of betray any of the the challenges that you that you had as a band or in, or internal problems you guys were experiencing at the time. Well, yeah, it's just it's just you know the will to power, man. It's just you know knowing that you have to complete something by whatever means you have at your disposal. And that and uh, and you know Eric Rutan. I mean, working with Eric, it's like you know our I we have a friendship, and also I have like ultimate respect for that guy. Mm. and um i felt in some in a weird way i felt like I, I would be letting him down if like things didn't really proceed and um and that was like a, and he helped a lot actually like he was you know he was he was a good guy to have in the studio when a lot of this stuff was happening because he's um similar similar to me in some ways in our just obsession with progress you know what i mean and also he, he like, he tends to lighten things up. I know Eric can come off as being a very kind of intense guy, like in the studio, but, but, um, he also has a very light side to him as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and while everything was going on, like, um, it was good to have him in my proximity because it, it kind of inspired me to keep going. So a lot of it is, is due to Eric Rutan, you know, just you know, keeping things on track, you know, and then yeah. he was telling me stories too about even crazier shit that happened in the studio where like, you know, singer quit on the way down and, and, and for a relatively, I mean, a big band, he was, I didn't want to mention the name, but like this band was like big, you know, there was a lot of like, a lot at stake for making the record. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the singer quit literally right before they had to fly some guy in, he, you know, he couldn't use the lyrics, the right lyrics. I mean, it wasn't as bad as that. It was, the songs were written you know, the drums were, were being completed. And then every, and then when I look at everything else, it's doable. You know what I mean? So yeah, it wasn't, yeah. wasn't catastrophic. You know what I mean? I, I was going to ask you, you know, uh, cause I, I've, I've met a fair few people who have uh, recorded or worked with Eric. I've, I've met Eric. I, I thought the world of him, but I was going to ask, you know, what is it about the style? And you've, you've probably answered some of this already, but what, what is it about kind of the way that he works with people or the way that he, um, that, that, that he, I wouldn't say mentors, but almost sort of gets the best out of a band when he has them in the studio, because he genuinely, I mean, if I think of most of, most of the recordings that he has done, the, the bands that he's recorded that I like, I would say almost all of my favorite records of that particular band was produced by him. Um, he's just, uh, he's an incredible attention to detail. And, um, I know a lot of times people think about, you know, I'm my, I'm my worst critic, you know, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. They tell himself this sort of, you know, this narrative, but you, you might be your worst critic until you meet Eric Rutan. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, I mean, if, but if you're interested in making a great record and you really want to be pushed and you're, you're willing to like let your ego um, take a backseat to the progress, the process of making a record, then he he's then you're, you're it's all good you know some people can't handle that you know what i mean and uh which is understandable i mean you know i mean it's not like ever it's it's always positive but be prepared to 
push yourself and be pushed harder than you probably ever have been in the studio setting. And, and I think that's why like all of his records have this like precision to them. Mm. And, uh, you know, and it also inspired me after the first time we worked with him, it really inspired me to, um, you know, dig down deeper in my technical playing abilities too, because you know, that I saw like some of the, uh, the weaknesses I had as a guitar player. And that was, I mean, you know, he's Eric Rutan. I mean, he was in yeah. like, ripping corpse, you know, it's, it's, it's intimidating. You know what I mean? He's played with some of the greatest drummers in the world. And I know like for, for us, it was very, uh, very intimidating going down there at first, but you have to rise to the occasion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember a story that Alex Webster told me once about um, recording with him and, and I think he had him do one particular take nearly 200 times because he kept hearing a pick scrape <laughs> like on one particular point. And he's like, you know, Alex was like, I, I could not fucking hear it for, for love nor money. And every single time he would stop and he'd play it back and say, I can hear it there you know re redo that but it's it's kind of like he's like the stanley kubrick of uh of death metal i would agree and that sounds like a very very accurate story to somebody who will work with eric so i totally i totally can envision that happening with him definitely yeah yeah one thing that uh, about the grand annihilation that I, I i absolutely loved and i always kind of wondered where the influence had come from and you know you, you just sort of you know as you're listening you, you know the various names went through my mind it feels of the nephilim sisters of mercy and it was it wasn't until i saw that you're a big fan of sam hayne who, who i love as well that it kind of made sense there's the, the, i would say that one of the things i love so much about that album is it's 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 it kind of makes uh I'm going to try and find, find the phrase without sounding too clunky, but it, it sort of, it creates impact with the use of space. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. So um, the, the, the song underneath, right at the end when, you, uh, when you're doing the kind of, uh, kind of outro chorus, when you're sort of just repeating Drown in the Darkness, there is a, there's, there's like this very short drum so uh, drum, um, drum solo, drum, uh, a drum roll. It's like, but it's kind of like a galloping drum roll, like, and then the drum goes back to a, a relatively standard beat. But it's like, it, it, it's, it's stuff like that on the record that I loved so much where it's not like hyper technical, but it's almost like that Sam, like, like Sam Haynes ability to sort of take a, take something incredibly simple, add like one little bit of flair to it. And then again, just let it sort of, ruminate in the space and because it has that space around it, it, it it's so much more impactful yeah i mean that's that was uh one of charlie's strengths as a drummer really i mean he you know as far as as far as charlie's technical ability the guy is great at stuff like that you know what i mean like working with space adding space to things because um you know prior records you know a andrew our, our drummer before charlie was uh excellent and but very compressed, very tight, very, like, yeah, yeah. you know, and that, that's, that's awesome too, you know, but you know, everyone has their strengths and things they do well. And I feel like that was one of Charlie's strengths as a drummer and also as a songwriter too, because he has a very good understanding of, um, of songwriting, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what he brought to the table with that recording, I think, you know, and yeah, I agree with that. I like, I like those little drum flourishes and everything. Yeah, Be because of all of the, the the drama and all of the the stress and the tension and stuff that went along with it, um, you know, do, do you kind of look back on on the on the material on the Grand Annihilation fondly, or is it sort of something that that I guess conjures up ill feeling and, and is something that you you know you might want to avoid playing live or whatever the case may be? Uh, yeah, I have, I have a pretty pretty negative feeling about that entire record actually, <laughs> but it's uh it's almost like. Um, it's going to be like my uh, my burning world, you know how like mm. the swans. You can't. I don't even think that burn that record is on uh, iTunes or anything like that. But uh, yeah, it'd, it'd be nice to. I mean, we don't. We're we're not going to be playing any material from that record moving forward. I mean, the last bit of touring we did, we we played you know like November Wolves and things like that from it. But uh, we're we're moving forward. You know, we got record. You know, music from the last the EP that's about to come out. Yeah, we also have newer material that we're going to be recording in the spring, and then there's uh, older stuff like we got stuff from, uh, you know, we're playing like the, the other EP, the um, All Empires Fall stuff. And, yeah, but we're we're really focused on on playing new stuff, so that's uh, that's good, and um, and stuff that's not released yet. So, you know, that's kind of kind of the, the vibe in the band right now. 
And what, what sort of direction is the new stuff taking? And I know that's a very obvious question, um, you know, and, and you don't have to uh, dish out any spoilers if you don't want to. But, you know, if, if you had to kind of compare it to anything that you guys have done before, um, you know, where is, uh, where is the new music going? Uh, I'm, that's cool uh, to ask that, ask that question because I like talking about the stuff we're doing. So uh, it's, uh, I would say, more similar to Savage Gold, maybe, because mm-hmm. that had like more of a death metal influence, I think. And, um, but also, uh, there's a new sort of vibe of, uh, I would say like a very East Coast kind of sound, um, like a little more aggressive. Mm. But at the same time, there's a lot more kind of vocal experimentation on the newer material and and on the EP that's about to come out too. Is yeah, the, the other remaining songs are actually will demonstrate what I'm, you know, hinting at with uh, more vocal experimentation, and uh, and then just um, kind of like a little bit more of traditional heavy metal, which is uh, it's always been part of what we do. But you know, harmonized guitars and things like that is is gonna start popping up more in the future tombs material, you know, stuff like that. I I, I get what you or I can I can see what you mean about vocal experimentation though, because uh, when I heard the dark riff, there's a I, I, I can't remember what part of the song it is, but there's a there's a part where your vocals sound very very much like uh, or, or very like a, uh, if I had to compare it to anybody um, like uh, Ashmedi from Elakash. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that 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 sort person. of super kind of a, a guttural aggressive scream, um, and uh, you know it, it suits the song really well. But you know you're also one of the only guys that can that can do like a Cole McCoy kind of clean vocal over a black metal riff and, and make it sound fucking badass. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, Cole McCoy is like one of my idols. I mean, I yeah. love Fields of the Nephilim, and you know even that that Zune record that came out that actually um, actually. A lot of people don't like that record when it was this Nephilim, yeah, Zune. Right? Oh, dude, I, I, so I love that album. That's actually what got me into Field of the Nephilim. Is I, I discovered that record and I absolutely love it to this day. Yeah, and, and for years that record, I think that the sound has actually played a pretty big part in the direction of Tombs in general as a band. Really, I mean, we don't have like that industrial feel that that record has, but. Mm. You know, it's got aggressive guitars, his vocals a little bit more, in, um, you know, on the extreme side. But then there's also that awesome baritone that he has. like Yeah. Music. And that, I think that sort of vibe has, like, been a huge influence on, like, what the band's, what Tomb sounds like. And mm. I've always been obsessed with that, you know what I mean? And crossing genres and having like mixing clean vocals with like aggressive guitars and things like that. That's always something that's, that's been um, an obsession of mine. So that's uh, going to continue and hopefully get better, I guess, as time yeah. goes on. And a great example of, 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 of his vocal uh, ability, like he, and, and his ability to, to kind of mix the aggressive vocals with kind of the singing vocals is on, uh, there's a track on that album called Shine, which yeah. I just think is just phenomenal just absolutely fantastic because he kind of like goes almost from like sounding like an 80s pop star at one point to like you know all the way into you know beast mode and then he he kind of hits the straps in between as well halfway through the chorus it's as i said i don't know why people don't like that album i think it's fucking fantastic yeah it seems like the go-to is uh elysium or like dawn razor like one of the and those records are great but yeah but those are more i would say on yeah like you were saying the 80s like kind of like like a uh, gothic rock kind of vibe. And then, you know, Zune was like way more experimental and industrial and aggressive and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know how, how much detail you, you would want to divulge, but you know, as far as metal blade is concerned, um, how did that, how, how and why did that end? And then how did you guys end up on season of mess? Well, I, in, in a way I feel like season of mist was probably the label we should have been on anyway. Um, yeah. Like back back when we wrapped up with Relapse, uh, that was on the table to work with them and also working with Metal Blade. And, you know, we, we were like, uh, you know, starstruck with the idea of being on a big label like that and, um, you know, being on the, you know, the roster that included such a, you know, such a 
incredible back catalog as well as like bands like behemoth and cannibal corpse who are yeah. you know bands we, we look up to obviously um but uh yeah i don't know man it's just um i just don't think that we probably we didn't sell enough records to stay on the label i mean you know i guess that's kind of the way things go uh so they didn't pick up the option to do another lp and then and and I, i'm not trying to say this in a way where like oh well you know if you guys don't want us we don't want to be on the you know we don't want you or whatever it was i kind of wasn't really feeling the vibe of being on that label anyway just because of you know there's so many records that come out with metal blade and i feel like in some ways unless you're in maybe the top three bands sales wise you kind of get lost in the shuffle there mm -hmm. and uh so the record came out there was like a, a very sort of basic effort put into promoting it and then nothing and then on to the next 30 releases or whatever so um towards the end of of that cycle or after the album cycle was over i was like man i don't know like i don't i don't i kind of have a feeling that maybe we we probably are going to be moving on and sure enough that intuition is correct and um so onward to season of mist i mean the u.s uh vp used to be the vp over at relapse gordon conrad mm -hmm. and he's someone that i've known since i think i met gordon in like 1997 when he ran his his uh, he had a, a another smaller label that he ran called uh, escape artist and one of my old bands was on that label so we've always had a great relationship and then um we just you know wrapped up and one door open one door closes another door opens we walked right into that relationship and uh so far i gotta say it's been it's been great um it's it's that small label vibe with like resources which i enjoy about it like it's a very uh personal experience and mm. and you know also i feel like um there, there's more contact which i enjoy you know what i mean and I, like I never met Brian Slagle the whole time we were on Metal Blade. You know, we didn't. Uh, you know, we weren't one of those top four bands, so we were like out in the fringes somewhere. So all the times we played Los Angeles on those touring cycles, never once met Brian Slagle. So that that was kind of an indicator of like where we fit in the pecking order over there. But everyone at the office here in the states, you know, we were in Philly, met pretty much everyone met pretty much they came up to new york it was it was great you know and and i think that's some of the great things that have happened just with the first two songs that were released is uh very indicative where i think our relationship is going to go so i'm really happy about that so yeah yeah and i i, I again you know sort of as an outsider looking in i i i think relapse did more to promote you guys than than metal blade did or the, the grand annihilation to me always kind of and i don't rely on labels really to discover music which and, and again part Part of one of the things I've done with this um, with this show is the only the only two um, labels that I have an active relationship with is Season of Mist and, and Apocalyptic Witchcraft because I I love a lot of what they put out. They're they're the they're the kind of label that where generally if they put something out I'm, I'm at, at the very least I'm immediately interested in hearing what it sounds like. But um, yeah, I, I, I felt like re that relapse kind of pushed you guys a lot more. The the you know the albums that you guys put out on relapse was was more kind of visible and in the in the eye line of somebody who might just you know read a magazine or see something online. Then the grand annihilation, the grand annihilation always felt like a bit of an afterthought as far as uh, you know promo from from uh, from Metal Blade was concerned. I agree with that, and that's not you're not the first person to say that. I felt like. You know, and maybe because of just the, uh, the the size of the band. I mean, I think our years of relapse, we might we had a we were. I felt like they gave us a priority. I felt like we really were part of the plan, the overall plan at that label. You know, and I, I don't want to say anything negative about Metal Blade. I mean, they have, you know, they have like a very, um, you know, they're an important label in extreme music. So yeah, uh, and I also don't want to like get into this thing where like oh well you know it's better over here it's it for us it is better at season to mist you know for another band it might not be and uh you know and i i personally enjoy the the current and and recent past roster of season to mist more than metal blade i mean yes yeah. on a personal level i think 
you know, the last like five years of releases on Season of Mist has been amazing, really. You know, you, had, you know, Mayhem, 1349, you know, it's incredible music has been coming out on that label. So it's more in line with the kind of stuff I listen to personally. So, you know, that's what I was, I was very interested as to why Mayhem went with Century Media for, for Demon, actually, and didn't stay with, uh, with Season of Mist. I mean, that's just, that's just kind of a side note, but... The, you know, Season of Mist seems to be the uh, label that would get a band like Mayhem a lot more. You know, same same with you guys. I think they 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 get tombs, whereas I'm not really sure Metal Blade would you know knew what to do with you guys. If you think about their other big bands, um, you know, and, and not saying anything disparaging against them, I love Cannibal Corpse, I love Cattle Decapitation, I, lo- I love Anel Nathrak, but you know, some of their other stuff like uh, Amon and Marth, I don't see how you guys necessarily fit in with those bands. I have to agree. And, and then there's other bands on there that are even further away from like what we do. Um, you know, like they, they have a lot of like death core kind of stuff on that label. And yeah, we, and we, we did a death core tour. So I know firsthand that that is not a uh, kind of crowd that, <laughs> that we would could really reach anyone, you know? So yeah. How, how, did, how did the death core crowd take to you guys? Well, that tour in general was kind of like a little under attended, I think because there was two, completely different bands on the tour and uh three bands actually no there was three bands on that tour it was fit for an autopsy us and uh and moon tooth mm. and all three bands really sounded completely different and that might have worked against i think attendances at that tour because there were definitely like you can you know you could pick out like a tombs fan versus like a fit for an autopsy fan you know what i mean so there were a couple of people would come out and see some some like obvious fans of what we're doing in the in the in the crowds and i just i find it hard to believe it's it just blows my mind that the typical fan of deathcore doesn't know anything besides just that one genre of music you know mm-hmm. what i mean um that that's a little it was a little weird at first i was like oh, i'll try this out see how it goes you know it, how it, that tour happened right around the time of uh the release of the album and we just did. I mean, the guys, and I think Fit for an Autopsy are an awesome band. I think they're a great band, but, and I like the guys in the band. And, you know, Will Putney is an incredible uh, producer. Um, the tour was fun. I mean, we got along great with those guys. And, uh, you know, I go out and see them when they play in New York, if, you know, if I'm around. And, and it's, um, they're, they're a good band straight up. And, but just the, the crowds were just a little weird. Yeah. Like some, some kid came up and he was like, I'd, I'd never heard of an avant-garde metal band. And I was just like, neither have I, man. Like, who the hell played tonight that's an avant-garde <laughs> metal band? I'm like, yeah. You know I mean? I, but I, in a way, also, it's like, it, it's like very young kids were at the, with some of those shows. And maybe that was like their entry point into extreme music, which is cool, you know? I mean, you know, I started out listening to like Journey, you know what I mean? So maybe mm. like my entry point in heavy metal was some different, route you know but it, it was a cool experience just was like strange at times um i don't think we're going to be doing any more tours like that i mean i would tour fit for an autopsy again because those guys are cool but i don't see us doing anything in that genre at, in the, any point in the future unless it's like some festival or something like that yeah no i mean it's, it's a death call for me is hit or miss i like despised icon i love i, I like acacia strain but I, I i get what you uh, what you're saying about audiences as well I, I i remember a couple of years ago i went to go see the acacia strain and there were three songs in i said to a friend of mine if if we don't leave here i'm gonna get arrested like it's not even <laughs> <laughs> like you know the, the the fucking kung fu kicking and all the bullshit i was like I, I cannot deal with this if someone knocks into me i'm gonna fuck them up yeah, totally. I know that feeling for sure. Man. Which, which I was about to say, I can just imagine a fit for an autopsy tombs, uh, tombs lineup. You probably have like the tombs fans in like a half moon, like a crescent moon around the for an autopsy fans going, stay the fuck away from us. Well, that was on that tour. We were really big. We really, you know, we, we had our, our fog machine on full blast on our set because I know it bummed out a lot of the kids there that, you know, the yeah. food kickers and stuff. So, I just thought that was really cool, like just completely filling the room up with fog and doing our thing. And the kids with like the, uh, you know, the offensive T-shirts, you know, like the really mm-hmm. misogynistic like T-shirts that a lot of those fans are into. We're just the, not the, they the, just weren't the, the luminous green logo T-shirts. Yeah, they just weren't yeah. into it. And as the tour went on, I think we got 
more and more into fogging up these places. Shadow at the end of the world Cast low the forgotten flames World born for a serpent soul Speaks to me in forgotten tongues I've definitely noticed in, in crowds as I, because I, I, I'm from South Africa originally. I moved to the UK in 2002. So I've been, you know, it's, it's, I was writing for a couple of websites um, and then got out of that. And then, you know, a couple of years later, obviously started doing this, actually many years later. But as I've been going to shows, the one thing I've noticed, you kind of start to see this generation gap develop where a lot of the old guard, especially for at older kind of more established bands, they kind of keep to themselves at, 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 at the back. And then you have the, the, the newer kids in the front, but the old guard have very little patience with the kids at the front. So yeah, I, yeah. I remember being at the Slayer farewell show at Wembley and some fucking idiot was, was again, was running around Kung Fu kicking. He knocked into this old guy and this dude must've been probably like, I, I'd say late forties, maybe early fifties. And, and eventually you just saw him flip and he just grabbed this kid, picked him up off the ground. And all you hear, all you see over the music is just him mouthing. And this kid is looking terrible. <laughs> he puts him down, pushes him away. And I've seen that at so many shows, Sick of It All, Simple Tour. And you, you, like I said, there's definitely, there's a big distinction between the, between the old guard and, uh, and, and the newer kids who are getting into it at shows. Yeah, you know, it's, it's good that you, younger people are, are definitely into metal, I think, too. Because, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, like culturally. And there's all this new stuff that I don't even know about that, you know, generation z or whatever you want to call them or checking out and uh you know a couple a couple of days ago i actually interviewed a lot moment from uh from dialect and he was playing a ton of stuff like this you know more like dance electronic music and it's like oh this is what all the generation z kids are into if you're 18 or 19 it's what the cool kids listen to and i'm like ah, that's pretty cool but it's like and i can understand like generally generationally like why this is appealing to people and you know, it, it technically it was cool but I also am glad that they have their like punk rock, which is like this kind of newer music. But also I'm happy that there are kids that that age group that are into metal, you know, mm -hmm. and are open minded enough to do whatever, maybe both or have the same feelings I had when I was a young kid and gravitate towards with the things I was gravitating towards. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, and some of them are really, really into it. I mean, you know, they, uh, you know, they'll they'll not just kind of listen to the newest stuff either. They'll they'll you know go deep, deep into the back catalog. So they'll be like, Tombs is great. So okay, I'm going to check out uh, Celtic Frost. Or I'm going to check out Trypticon or any anything that it, in, that influenced you guys. Yeah, I think that's um, and that's kind of the whole spirit of this style of music. I mm. think I know for me it is. It's like when you know I'd buy LPs when I was a kid and I would look in the thanks list you know what I yeah mean? I think it's a common thing where you'd be like oh these guys like nuclear assault let me check out nuclear assault and I buy a nuclear assault record and then they're into like all these like hardcore bands and I check those out and then from there you start getting into like the depth of the of, of what's going on musically with everyone and the whole scene or whatever and and that's um I think very much part of like the metal subculture is being obsessive about well this guy played guitar in this band for five years and he joined this band and these guys were in the same city together they were around at the same time and you know these guys are what's called new wave of british heavy metal so mm. i have to listen to like tigers of pantang i'm going to check them out and i'm also going to check out diamond head and you know iron maiden was was around at that same time so there are they a new wave of british heavy metal band Venom's a black metal band, but they're listed as, you know, that kind of stuff. You get all yeah. intense about those, those things. And that's yeah, the yeah. nature of this music, really, you know? Yeah, I, I definitely think there's a, I think I think the music draws an incredibly diverse, you know, group of people. Um, 
but I, I think there's kind of a thread of intensity running through everybody's personality. And there's kind of, there's, there's always for me, I've always said this when it comes to metal, it's like there's two, there's two types of people that listen to this. There's, there's, the, there's the alienated kid at school who falls in with a metal crowd because generally, you know, contrary to uh, belief, we're, we're a fairly, you know, accepting bunch. So they kind of fall in with a metal crowd, but in three, four years' time, they're going to go, oh, I outgrew that, and you know. Maybe they've come out of puberty or they've started hitting the gym and they become more popular. But there's there are there is that that group and you can kind of you, you can almost kind of spot them in the crowd. The the, the guys with the with the, or the or the girls with the intense streak running through their personality and they will be into it forever, no matter what happens. Yeah, I agree with that completely. You know. Um just actually again on the topic of Mayhem and 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 newer fans, the thing I was amazed to see was when Mayhem played London. Um I didn't see them on the on the on the Demon uh show, but they they did a they did a show about six months prior. I was amazed to see how many young fans were into that band. And I've also been it's also been amazing to see sort of the the resurgence in that band's popularity and the hype around Demon, which it's it's justified because the album's fucking amazing. Um and obviously the you know Lords of Chaos came out, but that's not exactly a you know, it's it's not exactly promoting the band, but it's yeah. I I, I was it's 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 incredible how that band has just sort of uh, gone very quietly gone back to being what what I would see as as popularity wise at least. You know, one of the you know most popular, if not the most popular, black metal band around. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think Mayhem is probably you know that Mayhem and like Watain and to a certain extent Behemoth, I think, are probably the biggest bands in the that are doing black metal right now yeah and but mayhem the thing about them is that they're and they've always been a, a very experimental band and they continue that trend with demon you know and yeah. that it's like they are I, I, wherever i go to the shows i see guys with mayhem shirts on i mean mm -hmm. everywhere you you know any black metal death metal show you go you'll you'll see at least a handful of people wearing mayhem hoodies or t-shirts or whatever and and it's awesome. And I think that, you know, Attila is like one of my favorite vocalists. I agree. And, you know, and their music just keeps getting we weirder, but more listenable in some ways. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there's a, there's, it's still a lot of hooks in their music, but it's very, like, there's a lot of time changes and, you know, his vocal style is like very challenging at times, but that it all works really well with the band. And I, I fucking love that band so much. Yeah, They're great. I agree with you. I mean, on on stage, he's fucking incredible. And I know your one of your favorite tracks off the new album was uh, was Malum, uh, same as mine. There's yeah. one. There's he does the the um, Tom G Warrior like like vocal ooh, like yeah, <laughs> just yeah, before yeah. the second verse starts. And that to me is like what takes him from being great to the fucking you know an absolute god as far as black metal is concerned. Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, you have to give your you have to give your props to Tom G. Warrior, man. That's for sure. Oh uh, well, like I said, one of the aside, he he has contributed many great things to to music, but the uh, the, the the oof in front of uh, <laughs> well, like just before a, a chorus or just before a verse <laughs> is one of my favorites. But um, I I mentioned uh, on on episodes previously that uh, I, I knew you were into the fights, and I knew uh, and I said you know I would love to get you on here to talk fights. So I don't want to keep you too long, but I, I do want to talk about it because um, you know I, I'm massively into it i've done martial arts most of my life awesome. i'm not not doing it anymore but i know you you, you still train you still do muay thai and brazilian jiu-jitsu mostly muay thai now um yeah i i, I don't reg i haven't regularly been training any grappling for a while uh, i had a bunch of injuries but um right now it's more of just like a uh finding a, a gym where i can do both uh in under one roof is um is challenging right now because you know it, Paying newer prices for training is uh, can be taxing on the uh, the bank account. So, um, to, to get good training at jujitsu and then to find a good uh, Muay Thai gym, you're going to be spending like, yeah, you know, like four hundred dollars a month or something like that. Jesus yeah. Christ, are you serious? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Just the Henzo Gracie Academy is just is just to do jujitsu is like two two twenty two some two twenty five something like that. Holy you shit. Know, like, I, I used to train at Marcelo Garcia's school and, and that was back when I was training there, it was like two hundred dollars a month just to do jujitsu. Yeah. And um, you know, then but my my um my main my love is really the stand up fighting because that's like I started doing taekwondo like back mm. when I was like, like younger and I've always been more into that style of martial arts, but 
uh, you know, I used to wrestle too. So that's why I got into grappling, you know, jujitsu and whatever, but, but right now I'm just training Muay Thai and, uh, but it's more of like a Thai style where there's a lot of clinching and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I didn't, I didn't realize the prices would be that, that different to, uh, to London. I mean, L- London has got some relatively decent places that you can go and train at, you know, and you can train with, with, with good dudes and guys that'll, that'll, um, you know, that you'll learn a lot from for, you know, pretty average gym prices. The, the gym, so the gym I used to train out of, um, they, they had team T U, which is a, a, you know, pretty big, uh, Muay Thai team over here. And they, the, their, their kind of head coach started a promotion called MTGP, um, which is doing really, really well. Um, one of their fighters is, is now fighting on uh, one FC. So, you know, and you could, you could, um, you could train with those guys for, you know, 70 pounds a month. Um, but yeah, it's nuts. That's, that's that expensive in New York. Yeah, once you go out to like different outside the city, you know the rents and the expenses go down, so prices go down. But right yeah. in, in here, it's difficult finding. I mean, there's a couple of gyms that have both, and uh, proximity, you know, and sort of making my day flow better is like that's another thing. Traveling from place yeah, to place yeah, is yeah. always kind of rough, you know. Yeah, have you ever competed, or, or have you ever been tempted to compete? Uh, just in Muay Thai, like I had, I had, uh, you know, some smokers, um, in Taekwondo, I competed quite a bit, actually. Uh, I never did any grappling tournaments except for, you know, just, you know, freestyle wrestling when I was like a kid, you know, in high school and whatnot, but, but nothing like, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, you probably know yourself that the guys who are, you know, fighters, that's like all they do. Yeah. Like I couldn't like go on tour for like two months, come back. And like, it's just not something you casually do, you know? No, and that's, no. you know, but, but I train, I spar, I do everything. And, you know, but I'm not like there, you know, there are guys at the gym that I go to now from Muay Thai, Rack Tan Muay Thai. Shout out to those guys. Um, Like we got two guys fighting tomorrow, Friday mm-hmm. night fights here. And um, they're there all the time. And I just, I couldn't do it and do the band really. And yeah. also that ship has sailed years ago for me. I mean, these guys are like in their twenties and that would have been the time to do it. You know, no one wants to see some, some old man up there, like, you know, gray <laughs> hair, throw, like throwing a, down a ring. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No one wants to see that. You know? I, 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 this is a side note, but I, I think you'll agree with me on this. Josh Barnett said it in an interview once, um, I think it was when he was on Rogan about people referring to themselves as fighters when they don't do it for a living. It is an absolute fucking pet hate of mine. Like I've met so many people that, that, um, you know, you train with at the gym, but the guy's got a day job, but he's not, you know, done any competitions to speak of maybe the, the odd interclub. And then when he introduces himself in a social setting, it'll be like, Oh yeah, I'm a Muay Thai fighter. Or I'm an MMA fighter. It's like, shut the fuck up. That's like me saying, I play some guitar over the weekend. I'm a guitarist. You yeah. know, it's not the yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. However, the guys who, who compete on the, um, on the amateur side of things, I, I consider those guys fighters just because like, you know, the camps, those guys do like real camps, you know what I mean? They yeah. don't wait, they do all that stuff. And and that's, you know, you might never make it to becoming a pro, but I think that all the dudes I know that are amateurs, I consider them fighters just because, yeah, yeah. you know, they're out, I mean, especially in Muay Thai, like you can fight like all the time between New York. Most, there's a lot of, a lot of good places in Jersey. There's a lot of good, competitions and promotions out there and there's pro fights and amateur fights all the time and for, i was thinking muay thai you'd want to take some time off between fights but these guys don't bro. they're constantly no. out there you know so no oh, well uh, you know the kids in uh, i mean wasn't it like like uh Sanchai has done something insane like four or five hundred fights it's oh, it's yeah, something I, fucking I, absurd yeah it's crazy man and uh, i mean i used to you know you know koban the legendary Coban, um, who him and Ramon Ramon Deckers had those three fights. Mm. I used to, I trained at his gym for many years in New York, and Coban has had three hundred fights. And it's like I just can't even imagine that. But these guys start when they're like nine. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I I will say as well. You know, one one of the things I, I've said many times to people when I when I talk about Muay Thai is the one thing I take away from that is if you want to see genuine change in the Western world, the government should mandate all all children to do Muay Thai from sure. from when they're five until when they're nineteen. There's a there, there's two things about it. There's like there's a there's a a bond and a camaraderie that builds between you and the people that you train with. I mean, there's 
you know, and you, you'll be able to speak to this too, but there's, you know, people that I've sparred with or people that I've, you know, who've beaten the fucking dog shit out of me, I can still see in the street three, four years later. And it's just like, there's just like a knowing and you immediately can start talking and picking up like you've, you, you've, you know, like you've, there's that, like, there's no time that's passed between the two of you. And then the other thing is, is, is especially as far as the, this kind of sniveling woke culture in the West is concerned. I, I think part of that stems from the fact that they've taken away or that there's been less of an emphasis in contact sports with kids oh, yeah. and no one has experienced the humbling benefit of a, a kick to the face or a fucking rug, you know, hard rugby tackle or something like that. There's just something about it that just kind of, it, const- it constantly keeps you grounded because it constantly reminds you that there is a, that there is a pecking order and that as great as you think you are, there is always somebody who can either outwork you or is just, just more talented than you are. I tend to agree with that. I think it's important to stay in tune with those things. Um, and, you know, here in the States, there's a lot of, a lot of this, like, no, no, everyone wins and all this bullshit. And I just yeah. think that that doesn't serve anyone really because losing is a motivator you know what i mean like like not 100%. getting first place is like something that should inspire you to work harder as opposed to like crumbling and and if you do dry up and blow away because you lose then maybe that's a good thing maybe you should dry up and blow away and be out in the fringes somewhere you know maybe you, that's you know in our hunter gatherer society in our roots mm-hmm. as hunter gatherers if uh you know if you can't take that Maybe you'll get eaten by a wolf or something. And that's probably <laughs> good for the society overall, you know. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and again, this this whole idea of of everybody being winners when they're kids, the the it has a fucking devastating effect on those people when they enter the the real world. I was one of the most. I mean, I've had many proud moments with my daughter. She, she's she's five now, but I remember when she was four years old. At a she was probably like three or four. She was at a at a, a preschool sports day, and uh, they you know they just kind of run a you know, run a, a sprint up the, uh, up the field and, you know, winner is, w- winner is given a certificate. And one of the mothers standing by the side of the field goes, you're all winners. <laughs> My daughter looks at well, her and goes, no, there's only one winner. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, yep, that's my goal. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's good to, to be acknowledged for competing, which is definitely cool and trying. Like that should go rewarded, but also you got to be like, well, you know, if you work harder, then you can become number one or play, get second or third place or first place or whatever. But the idea of winning is always important, I think, because that is like the whole nature of, of survival, really. You yeah. Know, it's, it's like a, a, a basic instinct that I think should not be rationalized outside, out of our makeup as humans. Yeah, right? yeah. Because the rest of the world isn't really seeing things that way. Just, and I'm just speaking for the United States and the fucked up culture that I live in right now over here. Yeah. Um, oh, d- oh, dude, it's the same over here. It, 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 really? it, it's, it's absolutely insane. And I, as I said, I think, I think people don't realize the foundation they are setting for, you know, the, um, for the future. You know, if you, if you're gonna move all these, these broken down mollycoddled human beings into the adult working world I, they 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 they're not going to survive and i i start to see it already because there's there's people that i've managed and some of the stuff that that, that they've come up with or come come out with or the expectations they have you're like where the fuck do you you know where do you get on this bullshit i see it too you know and like i said i haven't really been in like in an office sort of environment for a few years until this past year and yeah you know i, I could see that creeping in even into the industry that i work in too you know it's like a weird you know like i don't know you know it's i don't want to offend any too many more people with that idea <laughs> that are out maybe trying to do this but yeah but, uh, go out go out and lose you know go out and like get humbled and see yeah. how that happens and how how that makes you feel and how that changes you as a person i think that's it's a good thing to happen, you know. A hundred percent. And actually, you know, again, I think it's, it is especially useful for, for growing, growing boys, um, you know, and, and turning, turning boys into men. You need, you, you need to learn how to deal with defeat and you need to learn how to deal with being humbled because you're going to be humbled, you know, in various ways throughout the course of your life. Um, and again, there's no, there's no better place for that, in my opinion, than, than Muay Thai. Oh, yeah, definitely. The martial arts are a good place to, to get humbled. 
<laughs> yeah. Speaking of getting humbled, now I know I know that you had you gave actually by ordering the pay per view a hard pass. But did you at least see the 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 uh, Conor Cerrone fight? Did you did you? I mean, it's only forty seconds long. <laughs> did you did you watch yeah, it? I think I saw it on Instagram actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, I think that fight probably would have been cool, like you know, a few more like back maybe four or five years ago. But, yeah. You know, old, old cowboy is getting ready to like retire, man. You know, what yeah, I mean? yeah. That was kind of a, uh, yeah, that, that, that was, there was, there was, I, I'm not going to say it was fixed, but I think they could have given him a tougher opponent. You know what I mean? Mm. To, it hasn't, McGregor hasn't won a, a fight in how many years? You know what I mean? Mm. And, uh, you know, Habib beat him pretty, pretty handily. And, uh, Cowboys lost, get knocked out, I think, in his last two fights. So, last three, so I think I think three, last yeah. three was stoppages. Uh, the last one was a was a TKO. Justin Gaethje, you know, knocked him unconscious. So yeah, I think he's kind of at that Chuck Liddell point where no matter how might how great he might manage to look, it, it's like the button is so sensitive now that when it gets grazed, he's he's gone. I agree with that, you know, and and uh, you know, so you're going to put him against a guy who's known for knocking people out, and uh, and that's kind of how I see it, you know, there was other mm. places they could have went with that. Welcome back to the UFC sort of, um, I'm actually kind of disillusioned with the UFC in general, really. And uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Dana White, man, I think, I know this is going to sound, this is very woke of me to say this, but I kind of feel like there's like some, there's some racism going on with the UFC. Um, you know, back to McGregor, you know, mm. a guy, a guy like John Jones, I mean, like, yeah, you know, that guy, they had raked him over the coals for all of his infractions, you know, mm. all of his, you know, failure, drug tests, all this darkness that was surrounding him. But for whatever reason, the the, you, the MMA press does not ever talk about the stuff that's going on with Conor McGregor. And I don't understand mm. why. You know, if you're not a white guy champion in the UFC, I feel like you don't get really any respect. I mean, except for Daniel Cormier. You know, he's like the one exception. And I would say it, towards the end of his his uh, title reign, I'd say Anderson as well. Not definitely not until the 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 Sun and um, feud, but uh, yeah, right, uh, right, yeah. You know, Mighty Mouse was completely ignored his entire time, and you know, there's the whole thing. Well, no one cares about that that weight class, but it's like, yeah, but come on, man. The guys like look at all the, the incredible things that dude's done for the sport, like technically. Mm-hmm. And to not give him any kind of like real, or to let him go, you know, like that. He's at one FC now, and it's just—I mm. like, don't know. It's—I'm not someone who really dwells on things like that, but you know, where they put their their promotional dollars to me seems suspect. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. Like Sage Northcut, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, nothing. Well, I mean. Him. I mean so, so Sage and, and and Paige Van Zandt were like their two big bright hopes uh, for quite a while, and I mean, it was they very openly kind of said that. Yeah, you know, and it's like these two blonde Aryan-looking, you know, people, <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah. like you know, like the the Aryan dreams, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. uh, but you know, there's like t- there's like nothing against the two of them. I think they're fantastic people, but like technically, they just weren't on the same level as some other people that were in, in, in the organization, you know, I mean, Sage mm. is a great striker sort of until he went to one FC and, um, but he had, you know, very limited ground game. And at that level of, of, uh, that skill level, you gotta be well-rounded at this day yeah, to yeah. do anything, you know, you know, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate, I think, you know, cause it's under the Fertitas, I think things are a lot better. Yeah. I, 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 I kind of I've never thought about it that way actually, but I, I I can I can see your point. I'd say it's it's it it might be more of a money thing, but then the flip side to it is I I do think often uh, the UFC miss misses opportunities to to tell really interesting stories a lot better and actually sell the fighters a lot better. And I know there's you know I I and in fact I I have said many times that you know there is the responsibility on the fighter to sell themselves too. But if you think about somebody like Amanda Nunes. Um, She's relatively popular, but she she's got such an interesting story to tell. They could do a lot more to uh, to, to to kind of sell that. 
I would also have said, you know, probably if they wanted to kind of guarantee a great fight, they should probably have, and I love Holly Holm, but they should probably have stuck Amanda Nunes on the undercard uh, with, uh, with 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 Connor. I felt I felt bummed for Holly Holm and Raquel Pennington because it was such a fucking snoozer of a fight. And, you know, the, the, the benefit of having Connor on a card is you want to get on the same card because if you can catch some shine off of that with a great performance, people are going to want to tune in to see you next time as well. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, but it, I mean, he, I was going to bring up Amanda too because, like, that was, you know, what what a compelling story. I mean, she's yeah. like a, a openly gay, uh, you know, champion, mm. and uh, that's good for a lot of people, you know. And and you know, with when with her and, and Ronda Rousey, like, Amanda Amanda was the defending champion, but all the press was about Ronda, mm. and I was like, let's come on, guys, let's. Well, the countdown show was, I think, uh, I can't remember whether Brandon Sharp uh, said something about this, but I think literally they had Amanda Nunes on for two minutes and Rousey was on for 26. It was something, it was, uh, it was something around that, around that ratio. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's like, to me, it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty glaring, you know? Mm. So, so, so if we move on to John Jones, because John Jones and Dominic uh, race is coming up now, I, I've, I've, I'm slightly shell shocked by how fucking off my prediction was with, <laughs> with Cowboy and, and, and Connor. Cause I, I, so I've, I've, I've generally got a pretty good hit rate with this. I, you know, I predicted Nate was going to be Connor in the first fight. I actually made money and I posted the, the, the betting slip online so people could see I wasn't fucking around. And I said, you know, Connor would win the second fight. This, this one, I said, I said Connor versus Cerrone. I said Cerrone is gonna, uh, you know, should should be able to weather that initial two round storm, and then you know it, it'll kind of end in a close decision. Which, like I said, I could not have <laughs> fucked that up more. With with, with Dominic Race against John Jones, uh, John Jones, in my view, is the greatest fighter of all time, bar none. There's nobody that even comes that 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 comes close, and I, I question whether we would see anybody this good in our lifetime again. But then at the same time, I. I I always there's always that thought in the back of my mind. Every time I've been too sure about the outcome of a fight, there's always been an upset. Like Luke Luke Rockhold, Michael Bisping, Matt Serra, GSP. You know, the, the, um, uh, Amanda Nunes, uh, Cyborg. Every every time I'm like, yeah, this is a fucking foregone conclusion. They're going to steamroll them. And 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 a part of me kind of fears that that John might underestimate Dominic, which he's got a you know he's got a tendency of underestimating people anyway. But he might underestimate him to such a degree where you have the under the underestimation and age catching up to him and, and and miles catching up to him where he just gets caught by a guy who who you know can really really punch hard. That's uh, I, I never bet against John Jones. No, uh, you know I mean, you know him and I mean we can aside from that one disqualification loss that John has. I mean John Jones and Habib are you know, undefeated. Really, yeah, you know, and uh, the thing is, you're right though. There's a guy out there somewhere that's going to beat John Jones mm-hmm. unless he retires. Same thing with Habib. Uh, you know, it's like almost like there's this asteroid that's like in some weird elliptical orbit that's going to strike the Earth again, and it's only a matter of time. And at some point, that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And that's how I feel about John Jones and Habib if they don't retire beforehand. But I don't know if Dominic Reyes is that guy, though, really. You know what I mean? But I'm, always, I'm never going to go against John Jones. I always... Yeah. always no, look, in my, in my mind, I'm... You know, as, as I said, I, I think John Jones is the greatest fighter of all time. I, in, my, in, in, my, in my mind, I'm going, he's going to steamroll this guy. But then, as I said, it's a bit like when uh, when Anderson Silva fought Chris Weidman. I was like, no fucking way, Weidman is going to be absolutely annihilated. I, you know, my jaw just like just hung open when uh, w- you know at, at the result of that fight. But it was the same thing. Like, you know, Anderson underestimated him. He was fucking around, and he just never ever recovered from that knockout. Like mentally, he never recovered. Yeah, I agree. That's he's never been the same ever since. Ever since that fight, he was never the same. You know. Yeah. And then second one, Valentina against uh, Caitlin uh, Chukagian. So Valentina Shevchenko right now is one of my favorite fighters. I, you know, as a as somebody who, who's who, you know done uh, Muay Thai, what she does to me is just it's it's just it's beauty, it's art. I, I think she's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, I, I would. I want to um, like I want to get behind uh, Caitlin Chukagian because she's she's out here in the tri-state area, you know, but. Uh, I just can't. Once again, Valentina, I just can't go against her either. You know, she's, yeah. she's amazing. She's probably one of the, definitely one of the top three 
female mixed martial artists in the history of mixed martial arts, in my opinion. Yeah. That 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 last fight where she where she landed the head kick, and I can't even remember who it was, but I, I remember watching the fight with my girlfriend and she landed those three really, really hard leg kicks. And I said to her, I said to my girlfriend, I said, in about 45 seconds, she's gonna throw a head kick. I could see it like being set up, and it's just the, the her, her technique is so sneaky because her 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 hips never really give away what's coming because she's so fast. She kind of does that 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 shot where it's almost you know, even if you were trying to read it, you're never quite going to get it. So she'd made this; she'd made the girl nervous enough to where she thought when she when she could see the kick coming, her instinct was to drop her hand and try and protect her leg, and then boom. And you know, I, 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 I she's one of those people again. I think I agree with your asteroid theory. There is somebody who's going to beat her, but fucking hell, I, I think that's a big mountain to climb at 125 yeah, at the moment. Yeah, you know, and she's still improving. I mean, she's like a young, young. She's really young. Still. Yeah, and that person that's going to beat hers maybe just now starting to enter into her professional career. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to let you go. Um, in fact, no, two. One is out of personal interest, and another is just, uh, in fact, both are. Savage Gold Coffee, whatever happened to that? I just didn't have time to do it anymore, man. It was, um, you know, once I re rejoined the, uh, the, the workforce again, um, being able to get orders out and I don't know, it just, it's just, um, it wasn't a lucrative enough pursuit where it warranted the amount of time that it took to do it. Mm. So I had to, at least for now, kind of let it go to the wayside for at least for now. I don't know. Maybe like, you know, I come back as like an extension of some kind of merchandise effort for the band or, but for now, like, I just can't, I just can't. It's one thing that has to like, just, I don't have enough hours in the day to do that anymore, really. Yeah. And then final question, because I know you're a big horror movie fan as well. And, and I have espoused my views on this movie many, many times. Hereditary. Did you, did you see it? What were your thoughts on it? I loved Hereditary. It was, it was a pretty great movie. I thought, um, I, I think that it's going to enter into the sort of, historical viewpoint the same way a movie like the shining did you know what mm. I mean? where it's like this kind of accomplished film but also incredibly disturbing too and uh unfortunately i did not like uh with ari aster's follow-up midsummer. Um, midsummer i agree with you I, I i was so excited about that but i it, it was fucking painful to watch. There were a couple of cool, gory spots, but gore doesn't really do much for me. If I want to see gore, I'll watch um, Korean movies or I'll watch uh, Japanese movies. But sure. yeah, it's just, uh, I don't know. It was a real, real letdown because I thought the idea was great. But, you know, after the high point of Hereditary, um, it just it just didn't cut the mustard. Yeah, you know, and honestly, throughout that whole film, I didn't really know how it was going to end up. And I thought that was, there was, I didn't see the ending. You know what I mean? And um, and the way it resolved, I thought was uh, was very interesting, very cool. And uh, unfortunately, with like once again, I don't want to slam Midsummer, but I saw that ending coming. I, I you mm. saw the the whole movie play out within the first like thirty minutes of the film. You kind of knew how it was going to end. So mm -hmm. I started checking out after a while. On that yeah. One. Uh, dude, thank you so much for your time. I uh, really, really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you taking the time. I know, I know you've only got a couple of hours before work, so uh, I'll, I'll let you get to sleep. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to be coming to New York. I'm actually planning to come to New York for Christmas this year. Um, oh, cool. I told my girlfriend, I don't want to be stuck in London. I don't want to be fucking sat watching TV over Christmas. I actually want a decent Christmas this year. So, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I ho hopefully I'll bump into you, but, um, take yeah, care yeah, of yourself. Definitely. Um, I, and again, thanks so much and really, really looking forward to, uh, to hearing what you guys bring out next. Cool. Thank you very much awesome. for the opportunity. Right, That's man, my pleasure, care. man. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Bye.
Thank you so much to Mike Hill for uh, for joining me for that conversation. I had such a great time talking to him, and I really hope uh, it's not the last time that he's going to be on the show. Um, that EP, like I said, is Monarchy of Shadows, out on February 28th on Season of Mist. Um, and uh, uh, based on the first two songs that I've heard, it is definitely worth picking up. Um, I am also extremely psyched that uh, Tombs are going to be bringing out uh, potentially a full-length album this year as well. Um, and I have been debating Toombs's position in my hallowed and soon to be um, declared top 50 black metal bands of all time. I know I mentioned last year that I was thinking of doing a, a series of episodes um, on that. I'm actually um, busy finalizing that list, which is really fucking difficult. Um, and I also want to try and finalize a couple of guests to join me um, to talk about it. But uh Hopefully you'll see that come up in the next um, the next probably two to three months. Um, and uh, I fully expect all kinds of hate to be thrown my way because uh, I don't. My default position is not to uh, automatically respect uh, metal or black metal sacred cows. Um, so I can tell you right now there are a number of bands um, that people will sob and wail about uh, who won't be on the list. Um, it's my list, so they can come up with their own if they uh, if they disagree. Uh, speaking of bands that I enjoy, uh, my first discovery of this week that I uh, mentioned wanting to discuss at the top of the show, um, out of Glasgow, a band called Lunar Mantra. So it's four guys. They make ambient black metal, um, kind of along the same tip as Death Spell Omega, Ruins of Beverest, and Dark Space. Uh, they have just put out their second EP called Psychosomatica. Um, it is available on Bandcamp. It's the follow-up to uh, their first EP, Genesis, which came out in 2015. And I really hope that they don't make us wait another five years for uh, for three more songs. Um, this is absolutely fucking fantastic. Huge riffs, um, very atmospheric, mid-paced, ambient black metal. Um, there are some occasional blasts, not enough where you start to feel like the band is being lazy. And just a, a, an absolutely hidden gem, um, as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I have no idea why they're not signed. Um, and I find myself asking that question of a lot of bands recently. Um, you know, I, I, you all know my view on Stellar Master Elite. Um, you know, they have now put out four absolutely magnificent records, and they are still not signed. Um, Utkena from Greece, top-notch band, um, you know, great production, great technical musicianship. Um, the, the artwork on their EP was awesome. Just the way that they present themselves is, you know, super professional, you know, and just absolutely on the ball. Uh, it, it makes me feel like, uh, somebody somewhere is sleeping because uh, if I think about some of the fucking dog shit that does get released by labels, it seems to me to be criminal uh, that these bands aren't getting the recognition they deserve. But that being said, uh, we can always jump onto Bandcamp and show them some love and support. So definitely, definitely do that with Luna Mantra. Um, this is a track off of their new EP, Psychosomatica. It is called Azothic Pyres.
Azothic Pyres by Luna Mantra off the absolutely awesome EP Psychosomatica. And um, who knew that a band from Glasgow could uh, create something that fucking grim, necro, and cult? Um, I don't actually really know of any other black metal bands out of Glasgow. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But, uh, yeah, if we're on the tip of a burgeoning scene, then uh, I definitely want to know. But um, yeah, Luna Mantra most definitely deserve your support. And as I said, you can check out that EP on Bandcamp. Um, go on there, and uh, if they have some merch, I haven't actually looked if they do, but if they do have merch, buy it. Show them show them some love and support. Speaking of another band that deserves love and support, uh, Frigoris. I, I don't know whether you pronounce him Frigoris, Frigoris, or, or uh, I don't know. But anyway, they will be called Frigoris from now on, or Frigoris. Let's, let's settle on Frigoris. Uh, they're a four-piece out of Essen in Germany. Um, they are on their fourth record now called Instiller. Um, it is available on Hypnotic Dirge Records. The lyrics are all German. Um, it is it's they, it's described by a lot of people as post black metal. I don't really agree with that. I think it's it's more sort of classically ambient black metal. It reminds me a little bit of a mellower version of Farsot, um, who are a band which I am a really big fan of. Um, and it kind of has all of the trademarks or the hallmarks of that band. So great production. It's quite slow paced, very kind of song centric and riff heavy. Um, nice occasional use of clean vocals, uh, you know, and just again, a, a super entertaining, really, really enjoyable record. Uh, this is a track off of the album in Stiller. Uh, this is called Funkenflug.
Einflech by Frigoris out of Germany. Uh, the record, as I said, is called Instiller, and it is available on Hypnotic Dirge Records, so do check it out. Um, and like I said, I think we've just spoken about the first two great releases of 2020, which by all accounts is going to be absolutely fucking huge. And speaking of huge, next week I have got on the show Henry Sattler of God Dethroned, um, the absolute legends of Dutch death metal. Um, they have got a new record coming out called Illuminati that's going to be available on Metal Blade Records uh, as of February the 7th. So by the time that episode airs, the the album will have been out for a couple of days. And uh, I think they've also released a few songs already, um, which have all sounded very promising. So it's going to be great having him on. It's going to be uh, the first ever phone interview. So he's going to uh, dial into Zoom, which means that if you watch this on YouTube, uh, you only get to see my face, which, uh, let's be frank, should be enough for all of you. Um, on that note um i am done this week um i hope that you guys all have an awesome couple of days ahead of you um wherever you are wherever you're listening thank you so much for supporting um thank you so much for uh, for listening all the way to the end and from the mean streets of surbiton on the outskirts of london i am bidding you all a fond farewell